Hi, I'm Christoph. And growing up as a kid, I was convinced I would be someone special, someone relevant, a great philosopher or something like that. I really believed that. But in any case, I was sure I would be a professor. First for physics, then for sociology, then for philosophy, finally for mathematics. I was sure I would do something extraordinary and be someone extraordinary. This, being special, gave my life meaning, gave me purpose. When I left home and started my studies, math and philosophy, my conviction grew stronger. I was special. I was there to do great things. You know, it was like early 20s hubris. Some of you guys might know that. It was like that on steroids. And so I walked through my own bubble of specialness, and then I almost died. Okay, now this is not working. <laughs> this is great. Okay, imagine you never heard anything about this, but then I almost died, actually. And um, so I fell ill, really ill, um, multiple episodes, and one day um, I had a roughly 10% chance of surviving that day, so that is 90% uh, of a chance that you don't see the next morning. But I, I survived in the end. And I was ill for quite some time, for more than a year. And I took very strong medication, and this medication changed me. The medication, the experience, everything, it really, really changed me profoundly. Afterwards, I could not focus, I had forgotten, and I could not remember. My plans collapsed around me, my confidence in the world, in everything, in myself, was shattered. The plan had been to do a PhD in math in Oxford and to continue in my little silly bubble. Nothing of that remained, neither from my side nor from the world. The opportunity was just gone. My plans collapsed and my life collapsed. I went back to my mother, who lives in Wuppertal. This is where I grew up. I moved into her flat, into my brother's old room. I had a bed and the room, uh, in, in that room and a computer. And then I sat there. I sat down and I didn't really get up for a number of years. You know, I had given up, not in the sense of, you know, temporarily being out of hope. Uh, no, I would really given up completely, totally, absolutely given up on my life. I was waiting, but I did not know for what. To this day, I don't really know what exactly happened, how it happened, but something in my mind went to a place where this was the only solution. There was neither a path nor a goal for me. It was just me literally sitting there, Nothing else, no forward, no backward, just stasis. I gained a lot of weight. In the end, I was at 145 kilos and I smoked roughly two packs per day. The cigarettes were actually the only thing that gave my life any kind of external rhythm because I had to walk down two flights of stairs uh, into a backyard to smoke, which I did roughly every 30 minutes or so. I, I did care for my body as well as for my soul and I had no friends, no contacts, no acquaintances, no activities, nothing. It was just me, sitting there, a fat blob of motionlessness, waiting, waiting for nothing. Even the German government agreed. I got heart's fear, this is the last devil of German unemployment insurance. And after a while, even those guys didn't ask me anymore to go apply for jobs. Those guys never give up on you. They had given up on me, and so in the end, everybody had given up on me. After a few years, just remember, I was sitting there doing nothing, 145 kilos and a heavy smoker. I got a gift from a relative to go onto the St. James's Way, this, the Jakobsweg in German. There's this very famous 880 kilometer pilgrimage across Spain from the Pyrenees um, to Galicia to Santiago and then on to the coast to the end of Europe. I decided to go there. I bought some stuff, mostly a backpack and shoes, and off I went. I did not prepare myself or my things basically at all. I just put everything I could imagine I could need along the way into my backpack and it weighed over 20 kilos in the end. Actually, your backpack should be less than 10 kilos for a walk like this. Oh, and I bought a Bible at the Dome in Cologne on the way towards Spain. I had tried to be religious earlier in life, but ne never with any success, even though I've been quite jealous of religious people. I think it must be totally great to have this kind of certainty in your life. And as I was going on a pilgrimage to Spain, you know, what get a better chance do you get? You start the first day in saint jean pied de port in the Pyrenees at the base of a mountain, and you have to walk over this mountain. It's 1,200 meters up, and then back down again on the other uh, side, uh, 25 kilometers roughly in total. And I, not in any kind of physical shape at all, I started. It must have been a majestic sight. Me, 
sweating, uh, walking up that mountain, sweating, panting, coughing, and stopping every 300 meters or so to smoke a cigarette, which didn't help against the cuffs. After a while, my legs started to shake, and I was completely drenched in sweat. My feet, actually everything downward from my knees, was completely numb. I didn't feel anything. And the incline got steeper and steeper. Think about it. Compared to me now, this is like 75 extra kilos in weight that I was carrying up that mountain, both in terms of body weight and in terms of the way, way, way too heavy backpack. That's actually like a washing machine, right? And so right now, I can't even carry a washing machine up some flights of stairs without uh, help from friends. And now I'm in reasonably good shape. And so there was an alberga um, halfway up that mountain, and I was already so, so exhausted that I decided to stay there, that I decided not to walk on, and I think if I did, had tried to do that, I, I'm actually not sure if I would have made it without serious physical harm to myself. Since so, I was sitting there at the end of this first day and contemplated my options, whether to give up or whether to continue to walk. I decided to continue, and so I walked on early the next day. Uh, one of the big problems if you go on a long distance hike as a really fat person is um, sich den Wolf laufen. It's a great German expression. It's, uh, literally, it means um, to walk in a wolf. It's friction burns between your legs, so you rub your legs against uh, each other with every step. And so after a while, the skin basically gives up, and all that remains is like a bloody mess. And uh, so if you do that for a couple of days, it's basically just raw flesh, and you rub that against each other with, with every step. But I kept walking, and so my, my body really ached like crazy, but I went, went, walked on for five or six days until I reached Pamplona, which is the first city along the way. And there I had to stay in a hotel, because otherwise my legs would never have a chance to heal again, and um, then I would have to stop walking altogether. And so I went into this hotel, <laughs> I laid down on the bed, and I stayed there on this bed for three whole days. Legs spread apart so they wouldn't touch, and I just did nothing. And I recovered a little bit. And then I tried to figure out what to do with myself and, and how to solve this problem. And so I went into the biggest shopping mall in Pamplona to try to ask for help. You have to see, I, I didn't speak any kind of Spanish at that time, and I was desperately afraid of women, especially of beautiful women. I mean, this is what being severely overweight does to you, and especially if you are in a situation like mine. And so I went into this shopping mall and I tried to figure out what, what to do with my legs. And I, yeah, I just had to find a way to st uh, stop this friction. And it turns out the clothing industry is not really prepared to cater to men with these kinds of problems. A lot of fat men, they have skinny legs and really big bellies, right? And so everything that companies like Nike produce is basically catering to this other body type. And that means that, that all the stuff that you can buy there, all the like bike shorts, sports garments, if you walk and you have really big legs, they just slide down towards your, your knees and then you have the same problem all over again. And so that didn't work at all. And then I, I had the idea to go into the women's section because there are a lot more women with really big legs than men. And so I went there and I asked the store worker for help in English. She didn't speak a, work of, a word of English. And so she called a colleague and then another and another. And in the end, I had five or six incredibly beautiful Spanish ladies standing around me trying to understand me, trying to help me, pitying me, me pointing towards my crotch, trying to explain what was happening. And you know, I just wanted to die. And I know that this sounds funny, and uh, you're laughing, and I'm laughing as well, but if you are in a situation like this, seriously, I, th I think it was the most ashamed I've ever been in my life. This was incredible. But I found the solution, woolen leggings in the end, that I cut off at the knees and I let it left a little slip and then I tied the slip up here together so they wouldn't slide down. Basically, I fastened them twice uh, up here. And if you also put in a lot of bandages and a lot of lotion, you get something that uh, approximates a workable solution. It's not elegant in any sense, but it works. And so I continue to walk. I got used to it. I got used to the walking, to the daily torture. My legs started to heal a little bit. And after a week or two, your body adjusts. It, your mind adjusts as well, and basically you reach something that is a lot calmer, and you can just do that for a long time. And then I started to wait for the epiphany, for the big insight, for the idea for the rest of my life, for the idea for my life. And it never came. Nothing at all had happened. Closer to the end, I got more and more anxious, even panicky. 
because I hadn't planned for the possib possibility that nothing would change, that it'd be an adventure, but that the journey would leave me empty-handed and empty. But it did. The people around me who had, I had gotten to know along this way, they were talking about how great this pilgrimage had been and how much they'd learned about their lives and how much they would change their lives afterwards. I just said nothing. Finally, I arrived in Finisterre, where you end the trip as it, Finisterre, is the end of the world, the westernmost point in southern Europe, and you can't walk on from there anymore because you're surrounded by an ocean in all directions but the one you came from, and so it's the natural end to the way. And it's customary to burn your clothes there, and everybody else was celebrating. I was really afraid to my core. I had read the Bible on the way, the whole book. What a weird book if you read it cover to cover. But even that did not manage to evoke any kind of faith, purpose, or meaning in me. I returned from the trip a little less heavy, sometimes maybe a little bit more optimistic, but fundamentally the same. And then I sat down in front of the computer again. And I fell back into my stasis. Completely fell back. It hurts to notice that. It gives you panic and an overwhelming feeling of helplessness, of being alone. That. This trip, that should have been the point where I broke free. I'd been so sure, or convinced myself to be sure. I had done everything right. I had faced hardship and pain and sore legs and beautiful Spanish ladies, and still nothing changed. You see my stasis, this, this state of me, this consists of a lot of tiny rituals. Everything in my days and all the motionlessness was engineered not to feel anything, not to be moved so that I wouldn't feel the void in me, as I mustn't feel that void. And the void just sucked me back in again. The stasis is not a depression. It acts before the category of feelings. It tries to disable feeling per se. That's why it's sustainable. You can live like that for a long time. You're not really living, basically. Let me give you a few examples of what I did during my days. I sat there for hours on end, for days on end, for weeks on end, for months on end, and years on end, looking at the same websites in a circle, just tech news websites, waiting for some updates. That's not, not the most efficient way, and I knew that, but I still I clicked, click, 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 and I looked at those websites, just waiting for something new to happen. I got obsessed with computer displays, and I convinced myself that I get a headache from certain models. I tried over 30 different displays in the course of roughly a month or so. I sent them back, uh, or I ordered them and I sent them back afterwards. Right now, you can send me in front of any kind of computer display that you want and I won't have any headache. The same I did for mattresses and a lot of other kinds of stuff that you can buy. I catalogued old music, building a huge library, over a terabyte of MP3s of pirated content with correct names and meta tags and basically just a list of everything that anybody has ever liked and I've not listened to most of it. The same goes for movies and TV shows that I've never watched. A few years back, I threw out all these old hard drives. All of my day was designed to give me an illusion of progress without any kind of motion at all. It was my own rhythm of motionlessness. Well, as I'm standing here right now, I must have gotten out of this, right? Out of my stasis. So what happened? In the end, it was a small thing, and it had to be a small thing. I went for a walk, after lunch some day. I walked for an hour, a route that became very important to me, across the train tracks, alongside them, through a tunnel and back. I don't know why, I just did it. And I liked it. For the first time in years, I noticed that I just liked it. I liked something. I was not indifferent to it. <laughs> this is a profound discovery if you're in a situation such as mine. I liked it, really liked it. This one day when I went for a walk, I somehow decided that I would do it again the next day. And I did it again. And I liked it again. And so I walked. Across the train tracks, alongside them, through a tunnel and back. It became part of my daily rhythm across the train tracks, alongside them, through a tunnel and back. And I liked it every single time. And during my daily walk, something amazing happened. I started to think, just a tiny bit, maybe for the first time in years. I started to dust off my, I call it, perspective motor, and I began understanding my current situation. It was a little bit like disabling an autopilot, but only locally. 
I started to think about the next corner, not about the ultimate goals my journey might have in the end. And so I made a plan for my next corner, the first real plan in years for me. I began reading all papers on weight loss that I could find, and I, I mean, I don't have any kind of background in biology, but I wanted to know, and so I learned, and then I knew, and I designed my diet. This gave me an incredible belief in it being right for me. This is like a nerd superpower in some sense. And I started, and I lost weight, and I continued to walk every day. I did not do anything else during these days. I had a headache every single day, and I managed to weaken my body sufficiently to get a heart arrhythmia that remains even now. I actually had an operation on this before Christmas. But that was the only way I could have done it. At the moment, there are a lot of books about building habit chains, about stacking one habit on top of the, uh, the other. Now I understand that's what I did. These books are trivial to me because they are true. It's correct what they are saying. I took this one small change, my daily walk, and I used it as an anchor for the next change. And the next. And each step becomes the platform on which you take the next step. After a while, I bought an electronic scale, and this is what it measured. It took me 80, uh, eight months to lose 55 kilos. This little uptick in there, by the way, this is Christmas, and <laughs> it took a little while off. I also quit smoking. And then I went uh, back to university, this time to do economics. And I mean, economics is like the light version of math, and so it was a good thing for me. And I mean, you, you've definitely heard these stories before, I think. They're these stories of physical transformation and uh, psychological changes that come with them. It's actually pretty cool if you live through something like this. So this is a, a lot of people react differently to you and, and all this stuff. But I think it's like when you're moving, especially if you're moving to a far distance place, another country maybe. It's, well, you take yourself with you, right? Wherever you go, you will be there however you look and however much you weigh. And I'm built with a certain set of, of constraints and features, just like every one of you is. And some of them are malleable, some of them aren't. My stasis and my rhythm have become permanent features of me. They are there and I've come to like them and to rely on them. They are capabilities. I can make them work for me. My rhythm gives me huge power to grind things down and to endure. I could have never built my company without it. It gives me so much belief. I know it's there and it's never going to leave me. I can trust it and rely on it. My stasis is like a great, constantly available reminder to keep going. It gives me a drive that, that I can rely on as well, basically. You know, this classical redemption arc where there's one big revelation and then everything falls into place and afterwards everything is right, I don't think it's true. I think in, in reality it makes for a compelling narrative, but it's not the truth. There are no big epiphanies. There is no big binary switch between two parts of your life. No big before and after. It's not this, it's this. The truth, my truth, is that it's hard work every single day. It begins like that and it stays like that. Hoping for meaning from beyond what one is doing is in my world and my experience pretty much nonsense. It's all in what you do and in the next day, nothing else really matters. And I love that, and it's great. Because the essence of what I've learned is as trivial as it is profound. You have agency, it's on you, you are responsible. I have agency, it's on me, I am responsible. And this is no reason to give up. This is the reason to keep walking. Thank you.